My name is Greg J. Smith. I'm a Canadian writer and cultural worker with Holo. Uh, today, I'm joined by German software developer and artist Karsten Schmidt, who I introduce shortly. Uh, and this is the fourth episode of Alt History, an online speaker series where we turn to artists to help us understand lost and forgotten moments in digital culture. So when I say alt history, um, I'm kind of referring to the fact that new technologies and cultural developments are often synonymous with erasure, forgetting why or how we used to do things, what words or communities meant. Um, so in this series, we're addressing moments, practices, and labor that has faded from memory or um, been outright forgotten from the last three decades. Uh, we're not simply waxing nostalgic here about the past, but we're kind of trying to critically engage this erasure or forgetting uh, to make sense of the present. So this series is brought to you by Generation, a Brega Portugal-based space for creation, performance, and exhibition within the domain of contemporary music uh, um, and the relationship between art and technology. And my team at Holo, uh, we're an editorial and curatorial platform founded in 2012, focused on tracking emerging trajectories in art, science, technology, and culture. And these interests manifest themselves in a few ways. Um, we make periodicals. We've got a couple of them here. We published three beefy digital art anthologies over the last decade and preview of coming attractions. Mr. Schmidt here uh, helped us with the cover of our second of three issues. Uh, we write online at holo.mg where we track interdisciplinary practice in an evolving timeline and through collaborations with cultural partners, exactly like you're watching today. So thank you again to Generation for the invitation to host the series. So I'm thrilled to be joined today by Karsten Schmidt, who will be talking about his personal relationship with the demo scene uh, in decades gone by. Karsten's a software developer, designer, artist, and musician with a deep passion and a 30-year career focused on creating, contributing, and teaching about open source tools and culture for computational art and design. For the last decade, he's been developing Thing, a vast and still growing collection of polyglot programming tools using languages like C, Clojure, Forth, TypeScript, and Zig. He served as an algorithm design lead at Nike and was an early and vital contributor to the open source programming language processing. His work has been exhibited internationally at venues, including MoMA and the VNA. So Karsten, please take it away. Um, yeah, so thank you, Greg and Holo and Generation for having me here to talk a little bit about the demo scene. Um, I have only, I'm not an active member of that scene or subculture or whatever you want to call it anymore but i have been part of it during my formative years when i started like first engaging with computers in the late 80s and kind of i also was quite active at in those first years like early 90s and when i still was on the Atari 8-bit. And back then, and I guess that's still somewhat true, is a slightly uh, passive-aggressive uh, call to action, this demo or die. And um, I think we will later talk a lot more maybe about uh, those kind of beginnings of that entire scene and also where it came from and where it is going. and. I'm still following it from the sidelines and I'm still as much as excited about new productions coming out uh, every year and at the major parties. And yeah, there's a lot of material to go through, but this is here more a short uh, few minutes about my own um, involvement from those early years. I also have written an article on Medium, which we maybe can share with the video once this goes live, where this is going in a lot more detail as well. Um, this was kind of how computers, or in my case, how my first computer looked like. That wasn't my own one. We only, I grew up in East Germany, and this was essentially what we had during an afternoon course at school. We had one hour computer time a week. And those machines cost as much like a small car. And they came with literally almost no software. And our task was to create our own game. Um, but we knew nothing about programming, nothing about computing. It was a complete crash course by the, the real definition of it. But then uh, the wall came down that year or the year after actually, and I switched to an Atari 8-bit machine. This is all what we could afford from like the saved up Western money from my parents saved up over 25 years. And there was not enough um, 
money left for even buying a tape drive. So that machine was literally on for an entire year until the war came down and we got more access to Western, hard West German money to then eventually buy a tape drive. Um, so a lot of the things, I have to stop this here from scrolling a little bit. So um, my really beginnings of the Atari programming career, if you want to call this, was literally here this um, typed up by hand uh, instruction table with all the 6502 opcodes. So that's basically the microprocessor in those 8 bit Ataris, but also uh, 8 bit Commodore machines, the Commodore 64. And it's really, even now, there's this whole revival of retro computing. And this is literally one of the most popular processors in the history of microprocessors. So it's still used to this day, and people do absolutely insane stuff um, with the benefit of having a lot more knowledge which has accumulated over the last 30 years. But this is essentially how programming looked like for me uh, early on, where we would just write assembly, which is the machine language uh, for the processor with pen and paper. And then you would assemble it via this instruction table into a hex numbers, which you then had during that one hour of computer time uh, you had to then type in and pray that it actually works. So it's a very different experience, but it was probably the best school in my life where I learned about so many different things. You can see it's not even just about all programming. We learned about typography, pixel art. Um, you later then also can you know, see in a few seconds, I started developing my own tools like drawing tools for making my own pixel art. And here you can see them, for instance, some tool icons for some of those uh, editors or here then game maps on games. Some of them I actually built, some of them never took off. The usual thing as a uh, teenage mind <laughs> exploring. Um, here are some more examples of them also the kind of unique aesthetics which eventually came out from the uh, demo scene, like using those and all the games culture. There's a huge overlap between people who started in the demo scene, just creatively exploring and mashing up chip tunes, pixel graphics, pixel art, ASCII art, mixing this with coding skills or joining up with friends who had maybe better design skills. Someone else only could really program well. Other people had a music background. It's a little bit like as if bands were forming, like small groups of people who then started working and collaborating and also sharing uh, code and assets and everything, and then regularly meet at so-called demo scene parties which would be, in, in my case, all over Europe. Um, the 8-bit scene in the late 80s, early 90s was already becoming the underdog and the 16-bit machines already kind of took over and they were a lot more powerful. So I can't really comment much on that because that was a different world, literally. Um, but we had fun and we were internationally connected even before the internet, a lot of stuff happened via um, so-called BBSs, which are bulletin board systems where you had to dial in via your phone line. And we had disc magazines, we had newspapers where we could leave small adverts to exchange and communicate in absolute slow motion because those magazines would only come out and would be printed only every two weeks. So, but you could communicate with people you would usually never meet in real life. And then in 1993, I'm skipping here now a few things. I was asked by this top magazine, which was one of those disc magazines in Germany, but um, internationally distributed uh, to organize a so-called mega demo, which is essentially a 
yeah, a collaborative um, project of lots of people writing small demos and then they were all collected on a bunch of floppy disks and then distributed during that party and later on via other magazines. And you can also see the very first time I tried my hand at 3D graphics. Um, we can have, we have a video version here. If I skip this a little bit. So this is recorded now from an Atari emulator, but this is really how this would run in real time. So, and also just to explain this background image is really hand drawn pixel by pixel. There is no copy pasting because it didn't accept, exist. So this is yeah, a long time in the making things like this. And what I kind of learned during like working, I mean, I call it working now, but it was really my hobby, but it was also so addictive to learn about all those different fields I was interested in, like design and making music. And I started learning keyboard and music production and I had built up slowly with almost no money, just like buying cheap equipment to build up my own uh, home studio, really. And then during one of those demo parties, I was asked by this game publisher to create a clone of uh, Lemmings, which was one of the really popular games back then. And I did this during my last year in high school, almost um, messing up my A-levels as a result by working four hours before school and four hours after school every day for you know, almost eight months to make the deadline. But um, that really then was essentially my first job. And then that led me to reinvest all the money I made from that to actually build up a proper music studio and then kind of I had after this project was enough of computers and the kind of demo scene. Um, so I did then something completely different, kind of focus more on music. And then a year later, I had to do a civil service and started uh, my uni as a result. But um, let's jump a bit forward. So these were kind of the very early days. But as I said, I've been, and also this uh, title of the article, the Jacob's Letter of Coding, that's really a little bit how I see looking back, coming from such super primitive platforms, and it's not unique. Everyone in, during, uh, who is in my generation kind of went, not everyone, of course, but a lot of people went on similar trajectories. We started in the deep end using like completely low level, so-called low level programming languages where you have almost no bounder and no yeah, you can say no boundary between you really and the machine. There's no intermediate software layer or mediation layer. You have complete control over what the silicon should do at any given moment in time. And that's a very different experience. Just uh, also you develop a very different understanding of this is your machine and it will obey your very every command. Young generations these days are my kids, who are not even kids anymore. Um, but they don't know that world because they, they, they live in a world where everything is mediated and controlled and you cannot even, you know, if it's literally computer says no in a lot of situations and everywhere you have different layers and different middlemen who try to in control or monitor or uh, whatever, analyze your every step and every click and every key press you do on those systems. And you don't have that when you work with a kind of low level language and especially on the super low level or primitive uh, platforms we had back then in the eighties and nineties. But the same culture, and I, I was kind of hitting uh, hinting at this earlier, in, I'm not following it super closely, but I follow a lot of people on Mastodon 
who are like interested in this whole retro computing. And uh, there's so much fresh energy at the moment where people rediscover and rebuild like some of the, even with original parts or with emulated parts in hardware to reconstruct those old experiences, but obviously not also what, what Craig said earlier, it's not about nostalgia only. For some people, it well maybe. Maybe you want to show to your kids like, hey, I did this, you know, or like this is how computers work back then. But for me, the main interest is really to get back to that in a way, way where we have, where the machine actually is in service of us and not the way around, you know, because um, and that has now nothing really directly to do with the demo scene, but the kind of demo scene instilled like working that way with computers and having complete freedom in terms of creativity, how you want to use the machine or even how you like one of the biggest uh, aspects of like writing demos is to push the machine to do something which no one ever saw before. And if you look at some of the best demos, regardless of the platform, they do that. And they do that to such an extent that it is really for some people, an, I don't know, almost spiritual experience, but only you only can have that experience if you actually understand or you don't need like a super deep understanding, but you'd have to have some form of technical grasp how insanely complicated that feat is to actually pull something off like that. And maybe we can later look at some of them. For instance, uh, these days, the demo scene, as I mentioned earlier, still is kind of organizing itself mainly in the real world by those so-called demo parties. At peak times, some of those demo parties in Europe, they were pulling like 4,000, 5,000 people, maybe even more. And they would all meet in some huge venue with thousands of screens and meet all weekend. Everyone would be hacking and having beers. And the main thing though would be those so-called competitions. And those competitions would be literally upstaging context, contests. So who writes the best demo given certain limitations? And most of the limitations are either hardware limitations or arbitrary chosen limitations like file size. And like for instance, we can later look at some like um, demos which have a limit of four kilobytes. It means four kilobytes is 4,000 characters. And within those 4,000 characters, they create a five minute long animation, which is generated in real time with no other, no other external assets. They generate music, which is not just noise, it's actually music with like effects and everything. And it's just, you look at those things and if you don't really care, this is fourth, let's say 4K demo. These days, a lot of people actually think 4K means the screen resolution, it has nothing to do with the screen resolution. It is the file size of the executable. And the whole other restriction is demos are always, and this is from the beginning, from, the, from its early roots, it's about running real time, not really playing a video or anything. What you see is what you get at that moment. And these are all combined um, requiring absolute mastery of programming, but also stylistic mastery of um, like inventing new aesthetics. And a lot of the progress, which is celebrated in the um, like games development world, a lot of those breakthroughs actually come traditionally from the demo scene. And they kind of have been cross-fertilizing each other, those two um, subcultures. So I'm now kind of digressing and I'm also running out of time, I guess. 
Uh, here are just a few more screenshots then of me not working on Atari anymore. But this is from 2002. That was um, a Shockwave 3D demo. So that's done with Macrometer Director. And unfortunately, I can't run this myself anymore. And also maybe something else here we can talk about. How brittle in terms of time digital art actually is. So this project is now 21 years old this year. This was, I think, released in October 2002 or something like that. But this video here, I thankfully found by accident last year, and it was the only copy on YouTube. Meanwhile, this has disappeared, and what I'm having here, this offline version of the video, is the only known copy of that project I can still enjoy. Because Shockwave was a proprietary uh, technology which was then sold to adobe like the year or two later and adobe did then completely shut it down um, because it was competing too much with flash which was their offering so there is a lesson i learned quite early on in my professional life to not rely so much on uh, commercial software and it was really something which initially then also pulled me to processing which started roughly at the same time and I think processing started they celebrated their 20th anniversary I think 2021 or so yes so they started the year late a uh, year year earlier than this project was released and as, as Craig said, like I helped in the beginning on some of the graphics stuff and I was then only like three, four years later actually becoming a user of processing, but then also had my own library collection and for me processing became more or less this kind of just container to um, have convenience uh, graphic functions, but everything else would be handled via my libraries more or less. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is processing had the huge benefit of being open source. And that means the likelihood of being able to extend the lifespan of the works created with those tools is already automatically higher than adopting in commercial software where the company can just shut down or sell the tool and whoever owns the tool next will shut down. We also see things like Unity recently pulled, where terms and conditions are changed overnight and an entire community has invested years of their livelihood and also like contributing knowledge and tooling. All of this is suddenly at risk because some people are just never having enough money in the bank. And these are all considerations which you learn if you actually engage with the machines more deeply than most people do these days by using those more or less tools which have very shallow learning curves which kind of give the impression you can have creative control over whatever you are doing and now even amplify it with with the um, generative AI stuff where your actual access or your actual level of control is so shallow compared to a more, let's, I'm not daring to say traditional process of, of working with computers, but I, I can't think now of a, of a better metaphor here. But um, I think what the demo is, what I'm trying to say is the demo scene instilled a mindset in me and also many other people early on that if you want to really freely express yourself with computers, you A, have to learn about the hardware, what you are using. And this is not a have to, this is also a super interesting thing because you actually realize how advanced those and how magic 
some of that stuff you are using on a daily basis actually is. You, 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 you kind of, by learning more about it, you lose also the, this kind of consumer mindset where everything is just seen as a commodity. Oh, here's the new iPhone, here's the new laptop, here's the whatever new OS update. And like, oh, wow, shiny new icons. Like all that stuff, what we are conditioned at large to accept as innovation or as creativity when it comes to like digital culture is so superficial, it's almost laughable. And I also have the same thing when I look at a lot of the generative art which has been created in the last few years. This is where we were 20 years ago. And like in terms of aesthetic breakthroughs or in like combining techniques or criticizing the system or having more political messages and stuff, Demosine can be just about scrolling text and big fonts and like sweet chip tunes and this, this is always part of it. It's the fun part. But there were also a lot of productions and also a lot of groups, which including stuff I did myself, which actually also had a more political dimension and where we actually really used those skills we learned um, thinking about demo scene as really a kind of multimedia expression, it also allowed us to, to make political statements. Like for instance, um, I don't think I can find, uh, I don't think it's online, but in 1992 or three, some like one of those years, for instance, neo-Nazis were on the rise in Germany, like big time after the reunion. And it was really scary. and. I organized um, a collaborative demo where I basically asked for a lot of names to just be sent to me. And then I did a kind of angst demo um, about that topic. And other people also did political stuff. And so you can also use this for very different purposes than maybe the stuff we will look at later here in our conversation. Um, I just wanted to, like, I'm almost here at the end and I know I'm way over 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Um, these are then here some screenshots also from when suddenly there was more interest from the kind of institutional art world in that entire scene. Uh, this was, these are some screenshots here from an installation I did at the uh, uh, ICA in London in, I think, also 2002, maybe 2003. And that was a sound reactive uh, installation where I essentially had this 3D liquid simulation of a dark oily liquid in a well. And when you started making sound, uh, that surface came to life and yeah, it was quite creepy, but also um, for me, it was a, a kind of breakthrough because it was nice to see then to kind of normally the demo scene or those techniques are, as I said, they are really more or less passive playback things, even though they are running in real time. For me, this was kind of the first project where I, which allowed me to bridge over into the real world and have actually real time interactions of people who never um, else would would touch a computer, you know, and that that kind of juxtaposition was really interesting. And obviously, it's nothing unique. There are thousands, millions of sound reactive interactive installations these days. It's all about yeah, this kind of stuff. I mean, not these days, but 10 years ago, we were there. <laughs> um, so here, before closing off, I also have here some more links where the demo scene is still very much alive and available. So the, probably the Facebook of, um, of, the, of that scene is pure.net. 
So you will find pretty much anything which has ever been produced and is not even notable in that sense, but just available. You will find there scene.org is more of a kind of file storage. It's I think still under construction as well, so, but you have might have to check. Demo Zoo and DemoParty.net. DemoParty.net is a really cool thing if you want to get involved yourself. I mean, all of them are great for getting involved. Create.net also has very active forums where you can ask questions, how to get started and so on. But if you actually ever want to go to a real demo party anywhere in the world, and they are happening all the time, not all are big ones, um, but go to demoparty.net and you will find the world map and then details of where upcoming events of that scene are. Uh, demo Zoo is also more or less an archive and has lots of links on YouTube uh, and so on. Um, we will share those links later on. You can edit this out as well. So thank you for now. We obviously will keep talking. Um, if you want to get in touch with me to ask any questions or whatever, just hit me up on Mastodon. I'm not on Twitter anymore. Um, people keep asking if I will ever come back. The answer is no. Um, but yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Karsten. Um, I have a million questions and I don't <laughs> know where to start, but I think I'm going to start with most people that have some knowledge of the demo scene have negligible knowledge of computer graphics. So yeah. I was watching a, a talk by um, one of the retro computing boosters that's emerged in recent years, 8-bit uh, kid or 8-bit guy. And he said something to the effect, and you you even said something like this in one of the emails we exchanged leading up to this. And I think you made a comment in your talk as well, but you can't really appreciate a demo without knowing the limitations of the computer it was built for. And one of the things he talked about that blew my mind, and I got this because I used to be a Commodore 64 user, oh, was really? he was talking about color switching. Yep. And he was talking about doing it at 60 frames a second to take advantage of the refresh rate of CRT monitors. So of course my mind got blown when, when he said this, yeah, and I, I understood that, but could you, just, for people that have like very nominal understanding of computer graphics, could you maybe just to the degree it's possible, maybe just talk about what some of these limitations were like? Yeah, sure. So for yeah. instance, I can, I, I don't know much about the Commodore because as yeah. I said, these were really separate worlds and yeah. there was also a kind of, even uh, compared to modern, technologies, and I also mentioned this in this article I, I've linked, I think what, like, just before we get to your question, I will yeah. answer it. Um, I think looking back, nothing much seems to have changed in the sense that communities around computing as a discipline still to this day, more or less organized around the tools only which they are using. So back then, it wasn't necessarily that you had a basic community or a Pascal community or a fourth community or a assembly community. You identified and you found your, your, your crowd based on what hardware platform you used. So it was Atari versus Commodore, or then later Amiga versus Atari ST. And like, and then all the PC people started like, you know, and it, all of those kind of communities were very insular. But if you look at it these days, nothing has changed. We have the processing community. We have the open frameworks community. We had the Cinder community. We have the Python community, Rust community, SIG community. And most people will spend their entire life, I mean, like I'm, I'm like simplifying this now, within one or two of those communities and there's hardly any cross fertilization going on really like actively you know and and even within say a, a large language like say javascript you know like web development you then have yes we all share the same language but most people don't even speak or learn the language these days they just learn certain frameworks you know like for instance, in JavaScript, you have React versus, well, what was it, Angular? I don't know how, how many people still use this. But 
like those two people or those two groups are not really communicating actively or constructively because they're actually competing with each other. And it's all about mind share and building monopolies and, and this kind of stuff. And if you compare this to how it was 30 years ago, what has changed? Really nothing, you know? And I, I found this always so frustrating that there are so few people actually willing to just dip their nose here and learn something and dip their nose there and learn something else and then at some point start synthesizing something new and combining that more. And of course those communities exist, but not at the scale I would liked and always hoped this would happen, you know? And yeah, but to get back to your, to your question, <laughs> So for instance, what you said about color switching, the a simple way you can um, think about this, for instance, on the Atari, we had different graphics modes. For instance, if you, and, and everyone used a CRT display. So a CRT display, for those who don't know, sends an electron uh, cathode ray. Yeah, that's what it um, stands for. Horizontally, over so-called scan lines. And this happens depending where you live in the world, 60 times a second or 50 times a second, because it's actually linked to the frequency of the electricity in your area or region. So in America, it is NTSC, the old uh, broadcast standard. So that was 60 Hertz. So actually Ataris in America, they are running slightly faster than in Europe because everything in Europe is only at 50 Hertz. But the point I'm trying to think is we had those different graphics modes and one graphic mode, for instance, allowed you to draw, I think 320 by 192 or 240, I can't remember now, old Atari people will now slap me. Um, but you could, that was the highest resolution you could get, but you could only use one uh, main color. So you had one color for the foreground and one for the background. So two colors in total, one bit graphics, so-called. But you also had another graphics mode, which allowed you to have only 60 pixels, uh, 80 pixels horizontally, but you could use 16 brightnesses for each pixel. And that allowed you to, to essentially create grayscale images but they were not necessarily grayscale because you could choose, in theory, if you were not in the demo scene, you could choose an entire kind of tint for the entire image. So you could, for instance, have 16 shades of red or 16 shades of blue, or if you chose black as the base color, you got literally grayscale. So, but what that chip, the graphics chip in the Atari allows you to do, it allows you to switch the graphics mode for every single scan line. So there are now again, let's say X hundred scan lines vertically. So for every of those scan lines where the cathode ray goes across the screen, you can change the graphics mode. So you could have, for instance, every other row, 16 grayscales, and you had the next, all the uh, odd rows, basically every other, uh, like say the second, fourth, sixth, eighth would be 16 grayscales and the first, third, fifth, seventh in between would be for instance, 16 different colors. And that on a modern LCD or yeah, screens we know these days, this would abs look absolute shite, let's call it in Scottish, you know. Um, but on a CRT display, what would happen is that the, the pixels, there are not really pixels on the CRT surface are actually uh, a powder made from phosphorus. And that powder would actually have a natural glow. Every time the electron beam hits that surface, it will start glowing temporarily. And what would happen with those really high frequency graphics mode switching is that those 16 brightnesses and 16 colors would start pleating into each other. And what you get is actually 256 colors, which is mind blowing. You know, it, it, 
a computer which can actually only have maximum 16 uh, brightnesses or colors suddenly gets 16 times that. And back then, I mean, these days we, we, we don't understand what that actually, because we are so used to everything is available without basically zero cost. But back then to actually see a 256 color image, which you made yourself was absolutely mind blowing. Like to, to have that much um, nuance available where you before maybe just had dithering, you know? Yeah. Or, and I mean, this is a very simple example. Also like for instance, one of the demos I can show you here, if we have time. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is from this uh, Halle project in 93, which is um, this mega demo I organized. And I also did the chip tunes for various pieces, including this one here. Um, let me share my screen again. I guess you were just mentioning this. So here, you can see, for instance, one of those impossible effects here on this wisdom logo. This is, for instance, where he even, like, he managed, the, the, the guy who wrote that, Peter Dell, he managed to switch the graphics mode even horizontally, horizontally while it was in a single scan line. So he can change the actual base color as that cathode ray would move horizontally. Um, and no one has ever done this before. Excuse me. So, but um, yeah, I see another part. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's a specular reflection too, you know? Yeah. Like it looks like a light being shown on something. Yeah, but also here, this so called plasma effect in the yeah. center that would also rely on that same kind of trick, um, what, what we just talked about. So, and this is the thing, like a lot of those really old school, and uh, as I say, like my involvement, my active involvement in demos in kind of stopped, uh, let's say mid 2000s after those uh, shockwave productions I did. Mm -hmm. But um, those early Atari demos, like for instance, here's another example. Um, this was just the intro um, for a uh, uh, computer club disc magazine where I was member of and they are really basic you know they are really just kind of combining some some pics on here you can see some funny fonts um, but it was not so much about like in this case showing off technical prowess or so it was really just you know have a nice little intro to the magazine it was a completely different um, thing but these days at some point in the early 2000s, this kind of demo scene in terms of aesthetics and also acceptable formats would suddenly explode and be a lot more experimental and actually cover a lot more um, yeah, fields as well in terms of it's not just about scrolling text and flying logos and, and kind of showing off special effects it was more about storytelling and even just completely abstract but really surprising um pieces which a lot of people like uh, was it the one i sent you yesterday this uh, far browse demo i don't know if you had a chance to look at it but debris like really counts this by, by a german demo group who had, yeah, they have been absolutely instrumental in the last 20 years. I don't actually know if they are still active as such, and they definitely have like a kind of fluctuating membership in terms of who actually belongs to Far Browse and who doesn't. Um, but a lot of their productions absolutely push the envelope in terms of what what was considered the the kind of possi possible <laughs> threshold what machines can do at at whatever time they would release stuff 
but also pioneered a lot of really amazing techniques, which then were used, for instance, in games design and, and games development. Like there's this one project, I think the product uh, it is called a product, but I'm not sure. I think it was 2000, maybe 2001. Let me uh, open a new tab. Up, oh, uh, poem to a horse is another really good one here, the product. Um, yes, it's from 2000. So I don't know if we can briefly watch this. So this is a kind of classic far brush thing. There are progress bar at the beginning. So by today's standard, this looks aged. Let's put it like this. But you have to remember this is from 2000. And the entire thing, including real-time synthesized music, fits in 64 kilobytes, and it is 11 minutes of animation. Everything you see here, the geometry, the textures, the, the, the music synthesis itself, everything is real-time, and it's done in those 64 kilobytes. And that was, no one has done anything like that, not in, like, institutional like graphics research companies or whatever that was you know unique at the time and absolutely pioneering and um and what my 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 criticism sometimes of the so-called digital art world which comes from often those kind of established art experts who know you know people who have worked with generative te techniques in an absolute primitive way in the 60s. And yes, they were the precursors, but then suddenly everything seems to have been forgotten until 2018 when we have now those so-called new school generative artists who have flooded yeah. all the, the galleries and like and everything in between as if it never happened. Like we had amazing museum shows 10, 15 years ago no one references them ever we had you know amazing artists inventing a lot of the techniques in the late 80s or throughout the 70s 80s 90s it's not yeah. you can't really single out individual years or even like decades here because it has always been a continuum and i'm what i'm really taking issue with recently is that there seems to be an, a, an or, orchestrated effort to kind of rupture this continuum and sell what has been produced in the last few years as something which has just landed like a spaceship. And now the people who are on that spaceship are the new gods. And everything in between, as I say, like what you call erasure, it actually really feels partially like that. And also, the, the, what goes in parallel here is, and that has not directly to do with the demo scene, but again, there's a lot of overlap from that cultural ethos of the demo scene to also compete, but also share. And there's, it, it's not compete like capitalism competes. It is a friendly, you know, like kind of upstaging competition. <laughs> Sorry. From the outside, it reminds me of really hip hop and the battling. Yeah, whether exactly. Break dancing kind of, or, exactly. or graffiti crews. DJ battles. You know, one upping one that another. kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely spot on. Yeah. Um, but likewise, this ethos of sharing happened way before, for instance, we, we have the concept of open source or free software, you know, like those those kind of uh, things happened already way before that, but they did happen by a group of people or they were practiced actively and embraced by a group of people who were by all means and purposes amateurs, you know, or what's another sweet word to call them? Enthusiasts. Like, <laughs> I mean, a lot of those words have actually negative connotations in the in the kind of, you know, if you try to sell stuff. And also what is interesting, the demo scene has for decades um, 
kind of resisted this commercialization. And it's actually really admirable how, how cohesive that culture actually is and has survived all those years and is not showing any signs really of slowing down. Of course, there is ebb and flow through various external factors, but there are, even this year, there were still amazing new productions coming out and there are new groups forming and there are, you know. Can we dwell on this a bit? Because like, what about, because like most scenes get eaten by capitalism and yeah. most most things get commodified. So what is it about the demo scene that has maybe I know that it hasn't like grown and lots of people don't know what it is, but why has it resisted this? I I I I'm really the wrong person to ask there. You, yeah. you will, I can send you some names of people yeah. Yeah. who will know. Well, I mean, what more. what are your thoughts, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um I don't know. I I guess I mean also you have to say. There, there have always were accusations, at least early in the 90s, where yeah. people were accused, individuals were accused of selling out by, for instance, getting amazing, well-paid offer to work right. for Sony or whatever, some big games yeah. company suddenly, and then they were off from the scene. And the same thing happened when I was more uh, like underway in music circles, like techno scene in Berlin and East Germany. And suddenly someone got a big record, like major record label contract. And it's like, oh, selling out. Like this stuff obviously happens. But um, I don't know. I really have, I guess, because it's so core to the, to the ethos of the scene to be non-commercial, maybe even a bit left-wing. I don't know. Like... <laughs> I, I I really don't I I don't also want to now hypothesize here and yeah. step on people's toes because as I say like I'm not really the right person to to do that, um, but I I just think it is interesting and I wanted to also lead on here to compare to the demo scene for instance and comparing it to say early generative arts that early is again wrong but the generative art scene from the say early 2000s um, which was in hindsight a loss a lot less cohesive and also this is maybe partially the problem we are also here talking about with erasure and stuff if there maybe would have been more cohesion and a kind of core belief in say open source culture and standing up for each other and like kind of um, supporting each other, you know, as artists or like I, for instance, still to this day have major concerns and reservations to call myself an artist because what I do is often, I personally think it is an art for myself, but I just have so many reservations about the status and activity and the kind of sales environment and social environment of what it means to be an artist in this day and age. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, there's so much in that world which kind of goes against the grain for me in terms of what I would consider an honest art effort yeah that um yeah but that's now distracting here um yeah. but i just wanted to make this comparison that i find it interesting that for instance this second like culture like open source itself as well is kind of there's uh, at the moment also a big uh, conversation with with um on, on mastodon about those things how is open source really still what we thought of it 10 years ago? The answer is simply no. It is really, it has been kind of uh, not inverted, but there are new behaviors and new forces, and they are not even new, but they have been growing over the last 10 years, which kind of have slowly supplanted this this uh, spirit of collaboration and also repro recipro repro 
It's hard. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one, man. I'm English native. And... So how is it? <laughs> Reciprocity. Yes. <laughs> is it that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So let's try this one more time. <laughs> so I think that there are forces at work in the open source community, like it's even wrong to call it community, but because there's infinite choice of of open source projects in pretty much any domain, uh, that ever, or so many people start treating them, treating those projects as commodities, and also really treat them like consumers. They're like, well, uh, you know, if I don't like this, I'll just go to the next one, and like zero involvement, and everything is just kind of taken for granted, but. This is fine. Even I do this in, in some instances. But what I think is the problem here is that this kind of behavior has slowly supplanted the spirit of collaboration and also trying to, even if you don't have coding skills, to maybe become like contribute to that overall project in other ways. Most open source software have also um, you know, for instance, look at early processing. Processing would have never grown to that um, like huge thing as it is now, this pillar of an entire community in terms of tooling, you know, like without, for instance, the early forums where people who even couldn't contribute to processing as such to the code base, they would be showing up daily or weekly to answer questions on the forum, to help newcomers, or to, you know, notify the authors of, oh, here's a bug, you know, like what, what do I, can you, here, I, I did some more research, I found out why this happens, or like all those things. And we still have this happen, of course, the open source culture still exists, but it only really exists for larger projects. And if you try to start anything from scratch, you have to spend these days so much effort to just convince people to even try something out that, yeah, I, I find that is a, a major change. And I think going back to the demo scene, for some reason, because I think there are more, it, it remains to be, <laughs> Uh, debated or figured out what those actual core values are of that scene. But for some reason, that scene has been so maybe the underdog of digital art for so long that they just don't give a shit what everyone else is doing and are very happy, you know, being in that insular uh, position. But from that also comes a form of strength which the rest has kind of lost. You know, like uh, early net art, all those artists, are they still doing stuff? Who knows? Like, and it's in a way sad. I mean, it's also natural. People have, you know, yeah. in throughout their lifespan, I'm getting older. I'm, I'm focusing on other things. Like, <laughs> but it's normal that things get supplanted, but I don't know. I'm just yeah. hypothesizing. Yeah, no. I mean, I, well, one of the things like I was like thinking about in watching the the many videos you share with me, and we'll share a playlist uh, for people to watch. But um, was just like that. Like, it's hard to view this stuff with contemporary eyes if you haven't seen it before because you've maybe only lived in a Pixar universe. But the same is true, friends. If yeah. you look at early net art, you know, like yeah. some of the stuff where you look at like Jody.org or whatever, like. Yeah. This stuff, you look at it now, if you don't have the cultural context of what that meant back then, it's, yeah. but I think it's the same with every art. Yeah. You, you need to engage and someone maybe needs to explain to you what that context was in order to yeah. appreciate it. Okay. I've got, I've got two All questions right. for you, which I'm selfishly <laughs> wanted for my own satisfaction. One of them, maybe we don't need to linger on too long, but I do want to hear your thoughts on it. And the second one, well, I'll just see where you take it. And I think this will allow us to kind of open up the conversation a bit more. Um, but one of the things I really got a sense of when you were 
like almost praising or with reverence the way you were talking about the limitations of these early machines. Yeah. And for me, coming again, not having watched, I've only kind of seen demo, seen greatest hits. I'm not pretending to be some, you know, super knowledgeable person about the scene. But for me, um, that it was such a trip down memory memory lane, memory lane, <laughs> and like revisiting all these like the like, rave tastic sounding, you know, the soundtracks that accompany them, and like what we, I guess, we would call chip tunes. Yep. Um, but uh, well, I mean, chip tunes about... are kind of over yeah. already in the mid nineties. I mean, not over. They are still. It's an active subgenre which will be kept. Yeah. But it became yeah. then those so-called mod fires, yep. which were more or less sample based, and then these days a lot of demos really just use real time synthesis um, of like basically any modern DSP technique which yeah. exists. By go on, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, I was just wondering, like, any do you have any thoughts? Because like early electronic music, you know, I'm thinking like house and techno specifically emerged from the yep. limitations of that consumer grade Roland gear. So I'm just wondering if you think there's any affinities between like, like the way that electronic music found a home in the demo scene. Yeah. I don't know. Just have any, I don't no, know if there's I, exactly I a question there. I just, I know that you're, you're, even you're a student of a music as much as you are graphics. I'm just curious. What are your thoughts about the, the how they kind of supported um, one another? I think like even like how is that famous uh, like kind of glitchy label N5 MD I think uh, they aren't they Canadian as well maybe not, um, but a lot of the artists there for instance they were um, using like the kind of tracker software what you would yeah. use for creating those files and even now you know those those tools kind of it's hard you can't really call it they have a a new moment or a rebirth that it's not true because everything is so fragmented now. It's just that scene exists and that scene is actively maintained. And the same thing like with Game Boy uh, musicians, you know, this is also using demo scene tooling to use this and actually discover it as the medium with built in limitations uh, apart from the hardware, you know, like, I mean, you can also argue most people who, who make music on Game Boys are not necessarily programmers, they, but they have learned to adapt to this tracker software and actually push this, push the envelope of what is possible with those kind of music making tools compared to what we could do in the 90s. You know, like I've last night when we were, when I was compiling that playlist for you. I, I looked at some new uh, Atari 8-bit demos from last year, and it's just, I have, like, you look at it, and I, I mean, it's now 30 years ago for me, so my memory is, you know, <laughs> fading, like, uh, from that sense, but I still have somewhat of an intuition how hard certain effects were to achieve, and what people can do with 30 years of new knowledge in between and the techniques we have discovered in other fields, you know, like from other parts, not just the demo scene, but general craft, computer graphics has moved on so massively and everyone kind of learns from those techniques and also starts exploiting them. But what is interesting to see you know, a machine like the 8-bit Atari had 1.79 megahertz. This is literally, uh, I have to double check my, I'm here on a MacBook Air M1. So I don't know how many giga, uh, gigahertz that has, I think 2.4 or something. Orders like of that. magnitude more. <laughs> no, several yeah. magnitudes yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. And to actually still create recreate obviously with the platform limitations activated to replicate those new techniques to kind of tell a story is just mind-blowing you know i i really appreciate when people have appreciation sorry appreciate an appreciation um, um for learning and applying new techniques but also kind of transposing this back into an, another culture. There's so much going on conceptually, but also aesthetically. And there, you have to be so proficient 
uh, on on all those different aspects, like as a, as uh, from an aesthetic point of view, but also from a coding point of view, from an editing and directing point of view, like the debris demo I mentioned earlier, one of the most amazing things really and novel things was that it's really almost directed like a film with amazing camera movements and like just the, the, the audience reaction on top of it. I mean, it still gives me goosebumps. Even after, I don't know, that was 2007, so it's like 16 years ago. And it still is as fresh as I looked at it those 16 years ago, you know, and... Okay, you just yeah, gave me sorry. a segue into my next question. So this idea okay. of people being in a room together and celebrating the work, you took a um, a bit of a swipe at... Um, the uh, the people on the spaceship <laughs> that landed uh, around generative art in the last few years. Do you think that space? It's not so, doesn't not have so that as... same kind of communal ability to come together and like actually like um, share the work. And maybe that's one of the reasons that that culture is a little different. Uh, I don't know. I think the the. I, I'm sure there might be some cohesion, but I'm not, I mean, I, I'm now completely out of that scene. I have to really say that. And yeah. I'm, it's also more or less by choice because I just did not agree with a lot of the sentiment and kind of attitudes going on, but it's fine, you know, like, yeah. and I also did a lot of soul searching and just kind of, there are more important things to focus on than yep. trying to kind of have some beef with the community. And it's not about uh, that I have some beef with the community at all. It is about certain behaviors of how history is being rewritten out of sheer convenience or for commercial benefit, yep. you know? And some, some of that stuff to me, and maybe only to me, I don't know, because so many people were completely quiet about those things, but it just left a very bitter taste in my mouth in terms of how several decades of effort were completely like uniformly by curators, by organizers, by bloggers, by yeah. you know peers, they are completely kind of wiped under the carpet as if like this never happened. And at the same time, like the, the, the worst part for me was of that whole thing last year is of the whole feedback I received, like the, the hostility and the kind of shit literally and like the, the classic social media BS which people encounter, you know, if yeah. you don't if you don't agree with the uh, majority opinion. But the, the worst thing for me, I think, was that this and like what I call now new group of people, what they can do at the moment, the tools they are using are the result of those two decades of open sharing and building communities and trying to convince graphic designers that generative design is actually a viable thing and all the yeah. kind of bullshit we had to deal with with even justifying that this is maybe considered art or actually is worth collecting or even worth looking at in the first place and maybe like conceptually engaging with it and actually figuring out there's something else going on like personally to me the visual stuff has always just been a a vehicle to learn more about the actual underlying nature of systems and yeah. like configurations and design spaces and all that stuff. The, the, the visuals themselves were kind of secondary, you know, they were beautiful to look up, look at in many cases or interesting at least, not everything needs to be beautiful, but like, as I say, the, the worst aspect of this new behavior or set of new behaviors is this neglect and disrespect, outright disrespect of where the, their own trajectories and their own success actually comes from. You know, 
that I, I really also would like to know how many of those people actually maybe donate to processing or actively engage with the tools. And it's not just processing who loses out here. It's yeah. everyone who has built this community over the last, say, 20, 30 years. As I say, it's not all starting with processing and processing gets, in my opinion, way too much credit for where that scene is, but it's, it is what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, like this is for me the, the the big differentiator. And as I said, I was very, very disappointed in how few people who have been like from my generation who have been around the block, who have been part of those earlier things, how they, so many even actively turned around. No, we didn't have like that stuff or like like kind of either being completely silent about it maybe for personal gain or to just also not seeing this themselves that what has been achieved is largely due to open source culture in the scene this entire modern generative art scene yeah. would not exist without open source culture. It's interesting that most of its history yeah. is before open source culture exactly. too. Most of its history is like before yeah. 1980, <laughs> like yeah. the history that has selectively been surfaced. And I, you know, Holo loves Vera Molnar and we we like her yeah, yeah. more and I we mean, feel I, obliged I to these people that did all this work. But it is from the outside, not as somebody that makes this work, but it is kind of interesting to see that like, it just gets quiet after 1980, yeah. who, who or what gets referenced. It's this mainframe, yeah nostalgia or something <laughs> or then people you know yeah. saying like um for instance in the 90s and early 2000s screensavers with generative art were a huge thing it was a medium yeah people would collect screensavers and yeah like all that you know never existed yeah and that was the insult against digital art for i mean you'll yeah, still find exactly. it in a badly written piece but what are most nfts but and I don't mean that necessarily. It's not like yeah. a cool screensaver, a cool graphics demo. I guess we can't dismiss that as being interesting on its own. But it's funny how we've come circ full circle on that. Yep. Um, okay, I've got one one more little question, and I don't know. I don't know if you. I hope. I hope. I hope you, it resonates with you. Um, I recently read a piece uh, within the last several months by a, a BBC journalist named uh, Stephen Powell, and basically mm -hmm. they were like saying, without the demo scene, we wouldn't have had Nokia. Because we wouldn't the, have IKEA. Nokia, because ah, okay, because it, the Finland, I guess, was such a center, and yeah. there was such a such an accumulation of big brains engineering their way out of you know hardware limitations that you yeah. know that was positioned to like I guess give us the the early wave of mobile phones. I don't know, just just shooting from the hip. Can you just kind of mm. think of anything that you think that it the demo scene has given us as a closer? And I don't I don't know if it's like too simple of a question. But what did like as a direct result? I think well, not has... a direct, but more like it seeded it seeded this culture of like exceeding limitations and like really understanding hardware. I think the the games industry would not exist in that yeah. shape and form without a demo scene. I really yeah. like for instance, um, one of the most famous 4K demos, like 4K as in four kilobytes file size, is uh, by. Uh, IEQ, which is uh, Inigo Quiles. I'm never, I might mispronounce his surname. I'm sorry, Inigo. Um, mm -hmm. But he he goes in the scene as IQ, and he's also the one of the co-authors of Shader Toy, which is this super, it's basically the Facebook of Shader Pro yeah. um, programmers or Shader coders, creative yeah. coders. And I really recommend checking out Shader Toy for anyone who doesn't know it. It's really incredible stuff. But he wrote this demo, I think 2007 or maybe a bit earlier, have to find out. It's called Elevated. And as I say, it's four kilobytes and it generates this you know, five minute animation of terrains and with, with synchronized music and effects. and he essentially then went using those same techniques and went also to Pixar to work on several of the um, uh, of their feature films and a lot of the um, vegetation and terrains in I think uh, Brave, 
Right. Uh, he was involved in that using essentially those skills he learned in the demo scene and also his website very highly recommend if you are interested in any form of graphics programming he does amazing videos as well um like teaching about painting with mathematics because shader programming really is just writing and interpreting formulas to create yeah graphics or pictures really it's not just graphics it's, it's like if you really uh, hone your skills and are taking an interest in say generative or procedure there's again a whole conversation about what is generative really not everything generative or traditionally it was generative is not just generated it actually has generative um, qualities it's a system which can you know exist outside a computer um but that's beside the point like really uh, check it out but as i said earlier since the early 90s really maybe even already in the 80s there has been this kind of a lot of the demo seniors back then even i was young as well we were really just teens like you know 15 to say early 20s before we had proper jobs and that would be our hobby but then once people go in the industry they would a lot of them would go into those kind of graphics uh, oriented industries and most of them really end up in the games industry and then kind of pioneer and also commercially exploit some of those techniques which have been learned and i think this whole push for photorealism I don't know if you can blame the, the demo scene from that, but this kind of always reaching for a higher and higher um, thresholds of like realism. It's also kind of the, the, I think the biggest problem of computer graphics in terms of energy consumption. Yeah. But what is going to be a growing problem that everyone is so conditioned now um, to kind of accept only those kind of photorealistic rendering techniques or like mich like you know uh, machine there's, learning there's type. two decades of mo movies you can't watch if you're willing to turn that voice off in your brain because the cg is so yeah but not real not enough. just that though, but also yeah. thing like this whole thing that everything has to look if you release a modern game say it has to look this utter photorealism to even just sell you know, to make kind of break even. And it, it kind of raises the envelope for everyone. But I'm thinking also it's somewhat counter to some of the goals of the demo scene to do more with less. You know, if you look, say, at modern games like Red Red Dead Redemption, it's, it's like 90-something gigabytes to download, you know? Like, even 10 years ago, this would be absolute insanity to do that and of course standards raise and i have no issue with that yeah but the problem is when you start thinking modern graphics require several hundred watts of gpu power yeah. running for several hours a day maybe you know if you are a binge gamer you, your thing is on for 12 hours a day 400 watts or more that that's gonna take an impact worldwide and all this yeah. bitching about um, bitcoin and ethereum and that <laughs> you know is this money better spent or energy yeah. better spent and i look at hungry eye. speaking of hungry eyes like vr what it, what is it we're like talking about like needing 8k per eye 8k yep. 120 megahertz refresh <laughs> yep hungry eyes um, okay, I, I think I think we can leave it there. Um, but Karsten, I really want to thank you for your for your time and generosity here. Um, I learned a lot, and uh, I don't know. I'm kind of really looking forward to diving further into the the playlist of yeah. Please of, do it's, it's that I've... you shared with me. Yep. Okay. Well, thank thank you so much, Karsten. Thank you for having me.